Hey folks, Ray from DCRainmaker.com here. Today I'm here to talk about ActiTrack on the new DJI Mavic Air. Uh, now ActiTrack is something that's really kind of unique to understand uh, and what the definition is exactly. Uh, there's two basic modes that DJI has for you to follow yourself or an object or something else uh, while you're flying. One is called ActiTrack and one is called Follow Me. On the DJI Mavic Air, there is only active track, which means that in active track mode, you go ahead and you recognize an object visually. You say the bike, me, a car, a golf cart, whatever it may be, and it goes ahead and it follows that object. You draw a little square around it, or you tap it in the case of the Mavic Air, or you can do either of those in the case of the Mavic Air, uh, and it'll simply track that visually using the cameras on it. That works really well when there's nothing around you, but if you get to trees or even like shadows and stuff like that, sometimes you lose tracking, which is a bit of a challenge. So then there's follow me mode. Follow me mode actually tracks the GPS coordinates of the remote controller itself. It doesn't work within the phone, but the remote controller itself. The challenge though is that Follow Me isn't actually on the Mavic Air. It's on the Mavic Pro, not on the Spark, and it is on things like the Inspire and stuff like that, but not on the Mavic Air. So this video is all about ActiveTrack, in particular ActiveTrack following myself, meaning I don't want a second pilot dealing with it, I want to have me to be able to go out for a ride or a run or whatever it may be uh, and have it follow me. Obviously I want to have control in case something goes wrong, but I want to be able to have it do its thing by itself. Certainly if you have friends that can control your drone, then you're going to get better shots in most cases with those friends doing that. Oh, and before we get too far along, I do need to mention why I like these small drones for the things like sports activities, whether it be cycling or running or anything, it's the fact that I can take this in my pocket. I mean, it's just super small. It goes like this, you pop this in there, fold that down, and this back around again, and you're done. And this whole thing easily, easily fits in my back jersey pocket. Right there in that back middle pocket, is awesome. Now I've been doing these sort of videos on Aftertrack for a long time with the uh, Phantom series, with the Spark, with the Mavic Pro. This is more to tell you how it actually works in real life than to make this some sort of like buttery PR thing. So with that let's get started a couple basic primer things. Uh, number one is the Mavic Air has sensors in the front and the back for obstacle avoidance. This is really important in Aftertrack because you are going to trust that it's going to do what it's going to do without hitting something. This is different than the Spark and the Mavic Pro which only have obstacle avoidance sensors in the front. However, most notably, none of these drones right now have obstacle avoidance sensors on the side, which means that if I'm tracking along from a profile shot uh, with me on the road here and it on my side, you gotta be careful that it doesn't hit a tree because it won't see the tree coming up. Whereas if it's from behind or in front of you, it can use either of these two sensors there. The next caveat to be aware of is that there's no sensor on the top of the drone. You may say, well, who cares about that? It's just the sky. Not really. The vast majority of my crashes with drones uh, in these sort of active tracking type modes are when a drone goes up into a tree, usually for return to home, meaning it's following along just fine, there's potentially a signal loss, as you'll see a lot of what happens here today, uh, and then it simply goes, okay, I'll return to home, no problem, and it goes right up into a taller tree. DJI's Inspire series, they're uh, prosumer style, style drones, like 2000 bucks plus, they do actually have sensors on the top of them, and I expect we'll see them come down to these cheaper drones as well time. The next thing as I mentioned earlier with active tracking is that it's following the camera lens. So unlike some drones like Stalker or AirDog where you're wearing a small transceiver or transmitter on your person, this is using a camera lens. So if it can't see you or inversely if you can't see the drone then it's probably not tracking you anymore. Whereas with AirDog and the Stalker drones they're gonna follow you because they're following that remote control, that GPS coordinates, the elevation, everything like that. Those are great for a lot of settings. I've done some really cool videos with those. You can see them up there but they don't have obstacles avoidance, which means you're still going to plow into the tree unless you're paying attention. Finally, the last caveat, and this is a huge, huge, huge caveat with the Mavic Air specifically, is it does not have dynamic home point. See, on the remote controller, there's a maximum flight distance option for the phone. If you have the control itself, the controller piece, there is no limitation. You can go as far as you want, as long as you want. But with the phone, it's set for 100 meters. For sports and stuff, you want something lightweight, so you're gonna use your phone. So what does 100 meter limitation mean? Well, if I take off right here, I can go exactly 100 meters down the road before the drone stops. I can also go 100 meters that way, I can go 100 meters that way, and 100 meters that way. I can do circles all day long within a 100 meter radius, but the second it hits the 100 meter radius, the drone will stop and watch you sail off into the sunset. So you may be asking, what's dynamic home point? Well, the idea behind that is it's constantly updating that home point or that takeoff point from there to there to there to there. As long as there's signal between the drone and the phone, it updates the home point to the last known location. Makes a lot of sense. That in effect allows you to go for as long as you want, as far as you want, and all is great. Unfortunately, 
this doesn't have it. My bet is it will show up, so it doesn't really make sense for the Mavic to have it and the Spark to have it and this not to have it, especially since these drones more or less share the same code base. The last limitation we're gonna briefly mention is speed. This thing maxes out at 34 miles per hour in active track mode, but the reality is that's kind of like a best case scenario. Uh, your biggest issue is actually gonna be just starting off. You wanna go really slow when you first start off to make sure that it doesn't lose you. Also keep in mind, you cannot have your phone in your pocket with active track mode, uh, meaning that the second the phone, the lock screen occurs, this will stop instantly. So you can't just simply put this in your pocket, you've gotta put it somewhere else. In this case, I've got it on a quad lock bike mount, I'll link to that in the description there. Works great for this sort of thing. I can get the controller actually around it as well, which works kinda of great. I wouldn't take really big bumps with this particular setup unless you were to rubber band the controller one more time around the phone uh, because it just sort of barely holds on. Okay so it's time to get this puppy in the air. We're gonna do a couple basic tests. One is I'm gonna show you what it looks like with the controller and the fact that it basically goes forever. We're gonna go down this road here until uh, we hit some I don't know way down there's some power lines and stuff that I'll stop in front of and then after that we'll cycle back to here and we'll start over again with just the phone and show you the limitations there and I can say on average I'm at like a 50 to 60 percent success rate uh, with the phone. I'm at probably 80% success rate with a controller, which isn't anything to do with me. It's just due to the technology and, and really how kind of finicky it is in active track mode compared to some of the other options out there. In an ideal world, DJI would just release a little transmitter and life would be happy and we'd be good to go. Okay, so with everything all set, let's get this thing up in the air here. I'm gonna go ahead and just simply tap the takeoff icons. There we go. It's always kind of cool when that actually works. Uh, then we'll just move it out of the way here. One neat little tip, by the way, is you actually don't have to put the joysticks in the uh, control controller if you don't want to. You can still control it just fine. So kind of one less thing to really worry about, which is sort of nice. Uh, so we got it up there. I'm gonna go ahead and pop on the road here, get all situated, and I'll show you how it all works. Okay, so we're ready to go. I've got myself on the, the bike here, uh, and now I'm gonna go into the intelligent flight modes for active track. So I click this little remote control icon left-hand side there. This is the active track area uh, right there. I tap that. It shows my first mode, which is trace, which means it'll follow behind me or from in front of me. I'm gonna go with behind me because that's usually the one that's most successful. Um, I click OK. You can see down below, there's also the profile option, which is off to the side of me. And then there's a spotlight, which is it'll keep the camera focused on you, but it won't fly the drone after you. Spotlight's interesting, like if you had a corner, a churn like this, and you wanted to go around it, um, like a big sweeping mountain bend, that would be cool for spotlight. Um, so with this, I'm gonna go ahead and see if it'll find me. Uh, so there we go. Little green dot there, a little circle on top of me. That's new with the Mavic Air. In addition to that, you can also draw a square over the top of it, um, and that'll go ahead and identify the object as well. I've been kind of mixed. In most cases, I find the square works better, but we'll go ahead and give the circle an option or a shot today. So I just simply tap that little dot right there, and then it'll go ahead, and in theory, if it finds it or if it locates it, there we go, just like that. Now it's got me all locked up, and we're good to go. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and start pedaling nice and slow here. And you can see so far so good, it's following along just fine, um, but I'm only going like maybe eight, nine miles an hour, not very fast. Um, so I'm gonna slowly increase my speed over time here. Uh, I'll get maybe like 10, 12 miles an hour so far. Okay, we'll go a little faster now, it's still following. And again, this is a fairly straightforward route. I mean, it's flat, there's trees on both sides, yes, but it should basically follow me. I'm gonna pick up the speed a little bit here, probably up to about 15 miles an hour right now. One of the uh, folks I know down the road. Speaking of which, I've chosen this basically totally deserted road here uh, in the middle of the day on a weekday so that there's really no one to worry about. That lady was actually just parked off the side there a second ago. Um, so it's nice, there's no one out here right now, which is what you generally want to do when using ActiTrack. So you can see so far so good. No real issues here. I'm gonna kick up a speed a little bit. We're probably closing on 20 miles an hour right now. And I'm gonna go to this roundabout up here. You can't see it really. Uh, but it's just up ahead. There's a truck parked off the side there. Doing some road work. And then I'm gonna try to turn around here. It's not really a roundabout, it's more like of a median. So we'll see if it can follow me around that circle. And that's where it lost me. 
And that's part of the challenge is quick turns like that don't work all that well. So that quick little churn was sort of the death of this thing in terms of being able to follow me. Still, it followed me for, I don't know, probably half a mile or whatever it says here, which isn't too bad, uh, about 543 meters. Uh, so not too shabby. Okay, now I'm gonna do a super quick reset. I'm gonna pull off the remote control there, leave it off the side, switch it over to phone mode. To do that, I simply hold down this button here in the back until it beeps twice, and then it goes into the Wi-Fi mode, and I can go in that. It's already paired up to my phone. Good to go. I'll reset onto the track here, and I'll show you that 100 meter limitation. Uh, now, before we do that, I want to show you some of the settings and some of the important settings as to why these things are useful and why the limitations are there. Uh, so to access those, you hit those little three dots up in the upper right-hand corner right there. Uh, and then we hit the drone icon. And you'll see right there, there's the home point settings icon. Um, so that is the ability to go ahead and set the home point where the takeoff location is, as well as where you are. But what's missing from that is normally right below that, which is the ability to have the dynamic home point. So I'll show you that on screen right now is what it looks like on a Spark or a Mavic. So you can see the option for dynamic home point. That, if I go back here, is totally missing on the Mavic Aero. Definitely a bit of a bummer. Uh, down at the bottom of the other item is, of note is the 100 meter flight distance. Uh, and that is again, 100 meters from the takeoff point where we are right now until down the road 100 meters, and that's it. And there is no way to change. If I'm with the remote control, the full remote control, in that case, there is no limitation unless I manually set one. Uh, so you can see those limits there. Uh, a couple of the notes on obstacle avoidance. We'll just go through those really quick here. You can see there I have enabled obstacle avoidance. I definitely want that set. Um, I have enabled horizontal obstacle avoidance and tap fly. That doesn't really apply to after track, so you can just decide whether or not you want it or don't want it there. Enable obstacle avoidance in after track, definitely. Uh, enable backwards flying, sorry, I skipped over that. That's obviously about to go enable backwards flying. With these rear facing uh, sensors, that's not a problem at all. So with that, I'm gonna go and put this on the road here. We'll go take off and I'll show you how this all works. Okay, so here we are all up in the air with just the phone. As you can see on my handlebars, there are no remote control or anything like that. I'm gonna go ahead and enable after track mode, just like before, no real differences here. Intelligent flight mode, tap after track, there's the trace mode, which is gonna be from behind. Uh, again, the one I find generally most successful. And then I go ahead and you can see it's got the dot there on myself already. I'll go ahead and simply tap that dot and see if it'll expand out and automatically start tracking me. There we go. So it had a little blip there, but it seems good after that. And we'll go ahead and we'll try to see if we can hit hundred meters. So I'm gonna go nice and slow because I really just wanna show you the 100, 100 meter limitation as opposed to showing you some of the issues uh, in terms of speed and stuff. Other thing I'm doing right now is I'm kind of opening my body up a bit because the Wi-Fi on this isn't super strong and it'll generally drop if I like lean over the top of the phone and stuff like that. So you can kind of just this way you can see uh, the controller fairly well from there that I'm giving it sort of the full signal option. So coming up on uh, about 70 meters now, sorry, uh, 90 meters. And there we go, right there. So I hit that limitation. At this point, it's still gonna see me there uh, and it's still tracking me, that's what's interesting. So you still see it tracking me, uh, except that right now, it can't go any further than that because that's that limitation right there at 100 meters. Now for fun, what we'll do is I'll pop it over here and we'll do a bit of a side profile shot tracking. Okay, we got ourselves all set up for this side profile shot. I just wanna show you how this works. Essentially the same thing. Um, now you can see it's not auto-recognizing me as an object. And the reason is, is that I've got myself a little bit higher up because I wanna avoid hitting the trees from the side and also avoid losing me from an optical standpoint or from a visual standpoint. Uh, so in that case, we're having some problems finding me, but no big deal. I can draw a little square over myself like that and that should in theory track me. Uh, so there we go. I'm gonna go off and start really nice and slow here and we'll see if it'll follow along. I can see the camera's uh, shifting a little bit, but it's already, it's already lost me. It's really, it's, it's not, not very good at this particular activity. We can go ahead and bring it down a little bit lower and see if we can get better tracking. The risk there then though is again the trees. Okay, so I've got myself a little bit smaller. It's got me an active track box. There we go. It's now locked in there so I can see it's locked. It gets this little like bouncy thing when it's locked. Um, I'm not sure if that's just by chance. And we're gonna try to ride this way. Went behind a tree. Oh, it found me again, which is nice. We got one more tree coming up that hopefully it won't hit. And it probably is gonna lose me. Oh, it's got me again. There we go. Now it's cruising. Now we're in business. Um, so it's still, Kind of losing me in and out here a little bit. It's probably gonna lose me off of this next tree. I'm there, I'm still there. No, it's gone. And that's really part of the problem with ActiTrack is it's so easy to lose and you're balancing this thing of do you want 
it to not have hit something like the tree, or do you want the shot? And you really can't get both with this. So where do we stand on Octatrack? Overall, it depends. It's not ideal if you want to go for a multi-mile bike ride or run or anything like that. It's just not going to do a very good job of that, especially if there's any sort of tree cover, light changes, uh, tunnels, anything like that. Definitely not good. But what it's good for is B-roll type footage, um, where you want to go ahead and get these quick little, you know, three to 10 second sort of shots. That's where it's actually pretty interesting, and that's where it does fairly well if you set things up. For example, I could set a spotlight on this corner up here, I could race through it, and that'll look cool because you'll have the beach in the background, the camera pans past me. That's a great shot for the Mavic Air and a great shot in general for most of DJI's drones with ActiTrack. All done by myself without having to have someone else here. On the flip side, again, if you want it for longer tracking, you're gonna probably have to look at something like the AirDog or the Stalker drones, because that's really where it's at. Anyways, thanks for watching. Go ahead and like that like button at the bottom if you found this interesting or the subscribe button. I really appreciate it. Have a good one.